Hey, everybody. <laughs> welcome, welcome, all you wildlings, to our 14th episode of our Lunch and Learns. And I'm so stoked that we've had 14 so far. It's the power of baby steps. Um, it's almost been a year since we started doing these. And um, I can't wait to turn them into podcast episodes as well so that they are available to folks um, out and about. I do a lot of podcast listening while I am uh, walking, hiking, driving. So wanna make this content available to you anytime, anywhere. Um, but I thought we'd look back and I was wondering, um, Rini, what has been your favorite episode so far? I have to say the last one was super intriguing where we had a member from the um, permittee, a regulator and two environmental consultants really seemed to resonate with folks. And I love the way the conversation just worked its way through those um, three different sectors within the, the type of projects that we support. Right on. And um, by the way, all of our past episodes are available on our website um, on demand. So if you want to check that one out, I think that was a great conversation and very interesting to get what we lovingly call the RPCs together, the regulators, the permittees, and the consultants. So it's actually about, stimulated a lot of further conversations that I'm having with people in LinkedIn and on phone calls. It's really um, caught people's attention. Right on. And Nancy, how about you? Your favorite? Oh, you know, the, the field people are near and dear to my heart. So I think one of my very favorite episodes was the camera trapping episode with David David Lee sharing about that and uh, seeing how he puts all of that gear together. Speaking of gear. Yeah. So, yeah. That was a really that popular one. one too. Yeah. Yeah. And um, so, yeah, so it's our 14th yeah, episode. Cool. Uh, we're heading into a new series called Field Season because we recognize you all are going into field season and um, that will run April through September and then we'll do another off season series that'll be October through February. So living our life around your seasons folks. Um, just FYI, everybody who shows up buys a meal for Territory Foods. We're still supporting frontline workers and feeding them while they're doing their good work. And um, thanks everyone for coming today. Uh, I will introduce our guest, Chris Webster, in just a minute. Um, I'm gonna let you know we've got some housekeeping as in there is a chat window, window to interact with us. And there's also a Q&A window for technical questions um, that you have. Uh, the Q&A is a little easier for us to track because we can mark it as answered. Um, so if you have a question for Chris or any of us, um, please put it in the Q&A. We will also be sharing some links in the chat window for you as well. Um, my name is Kristen Hazard. I'm founder and CEO of WildNote. I am here with Rini Punzi, our uh, strategy and operations guru, um, currently doing a bunch of selling for WildNote, working out with our potential customers. And finally, everybody's favorite person at Wild Note, the person in charge of all of our happiness, as well as our customers, Nancy Douglas, our director of customer success. Hey, everybody. And our guest today, oh gosh, this guy. Oh, he's amazing, amazing, forward thinking innovator in his industry, um, innovating in many different ways. He's always innovating with technology, but he also created the very first Archaeology Podcast Network and did that very, very early in podcasting. And you've built up what, what kind of, just give us a little information about that network, Chris, what you've built with that. Yeah, I mean, we have put together, uh, we've got about 14 active, um, active podcasts right now with a whole bunch in the back catalog. And we've got about a little over 3000 episodes in the back catalog and we're getting close to 50,000 downloads a month across the world, so. Amazing. Amazing. I'm like, yeah. we've done 14 episodes. <laughs> 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 That's yeah. great. That's it's... great. Um, and he's also a working archaeologist. I still can't spell that. I'm glad I don't have to right now. Um, but he's also out there in the field um, doing the working archaeology. And with his tech geek gearness and his working um, we thought he'd be the perfect guest um, to talk about gearing up for field season. So that's what we're doing today. Um, when I first 
uh, built wild note, it was it was strictly um, I was thinking of it for environmental compliance, and um, I got to see a little bit that there would be these cultural components of the compliance project. So I thought maybe it would work for cultural, but it was just an inkling. And uh, I remember I think Rini and I went um, to a CRM firm, and they didn't see the vision at all. So we sort of dropped it. And then I think it was a podcast episode that Chris invited uh, Nancy and I yeah. to be on. And that's when we yep. first started interacting with each other. And then next thing I know, this guy's driving down from Reno, getting in a conference room with us and whiteboarding out how we could make wild note work for CRM. I mean, the guy drove down. This is how much he believes <laughs> in technology revolutionizing his field. Um, and thus began our relationship with Chris and he's been uh, you know, um, ebbing and flowing in different roles um, as uh, advisor. Um, he's, he's definitely our CRM advisor. He comes in for um, big cultural resource management implementations. He'll do trainings. I mean, he knows the platform for CRM better than I know the platform for CRM. He is the guy. And um, so it's really a great opportunity to have him today to talk not only about geeky gear stuff, but also how he gears up for the field season with respect to Wild Note and what he does in the off season to prepare either for big projects coming up or just a new field season. So one more thing, I'll just give, you know, the actual bio of him. So he's BA in our anthropology, MS in archaeological resource management, registered professional archaeologist and graduate of the podcast engineering school. He's managed projects for more than 30,000 acres and worked in 18 U.S. states in 2012. Chris formed DigTech, the umbrella company for all of his projects and passions. Through DigTech, he started the Archaeology Podcast Network, also known as APN, and Chris Webster Productions. The APN is a network of over 18 podcasts and 25 expert hosts and over 100,000 monthly subscribers. Managed with Tristan Boyle, the APN is the only podcast network dedicated to education about archaeology. Chris also serves as the cultural resource management archaeology advisor and client specialist for Wild Note. Welcome, Chris Webster. Woo thanks, Great thanks. to have you here. First question, Chris. <laughs> have you seen the movie Nomadland? Not yet. It's just come across our radar. We're definitely going to watch it. So the other thing about Chris is that he is a nomad right now, right? Give us that's a right. little bit of that yep. information, please. Well, anybody that's familiar with CRM archaeology knows that you're kind of nomads the whole time. And my wife and I have lived and traveled across the country doing field work. And, you know, for the last decade or so, we've been based pretty much out of Reno, Nevada. And last June, everything just kind of came together work-wise and, and personal life-wise. And we bought a uh, 36 foot class A motorhome, and we've been traveling around the country in it since June. Um, still able to social distance and do all those things. We're just doing it from our home in different locations around the country. So uh, we're on the East Coast right now in Jekyll Island, Georgia, and we'll be headed back towards the West Coast probably sometime mid-May, and then doing a, a tour of the California coast in, uh, in the fall, if not late summer. But some field work's gonna take some precedence on that. So I'm gonna heed my own advice during this discussion. <laughs> you've, come a, you've come a long way from camping in the back of your truck, eh? I'll tell you what, yeah, it's pretty nice. <laughs> <laughs> you got that Peloton in yep. there? <laughs> I wish. That's the one thing I had to sell. It just wouldn't, you know, it would fit, but when the slides come in, it won't fit. So we can't like drive with it. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, man. So yeah. um, uh, we, 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 you coi we've coined a new term because of you. And it's if you uh, if you track your RV mileage with Wild Note, you may be a wild nerd. So you are the one and only yeah. original wild nerd. And I'm uh, we've got a little <laughs> teaser uh, wild nerd uh, referral program coming up soon. So nice. uh, stay tuned for that. But um, we do this. Might I may have answered my question, but what is the craziest thing you've used Wild Note for? <laughs> It's, it's got to be that because it didn't start with the RV. That logbook started with the boat that we owned before we sold the RV because I wanted to track like engine hours and maintenance and stuff like that on it. And it just translated straight into the RV. And, uh, and because we use all this for business a lot too. So it's a good actual use.
Oh, okay. you How's that sound? That's good. Okay. Awesome. Yeah, it had got the, it had gone back to the internet. I have three cell plans in order to manage my digital life right now. So you just got to find the right one that works at any time. Oh my god. <laughs> So yeah. you can try that and wild note, I think. Even That's reading's right. a little bit delayed. Do you hear that, Nancy? Yeah. That yeah. Okay. Um, which is strange because we're all in the office. So did you buy any new gear this year, Chris? You know, um, a little bit. Um, upgraded an iPad and uh, some new batteries and stuff. Um, and then uh, it's really you know, this kind of translates into WildNote as well, because sometimes you just need the right plans, but we've got, we do actually have three new cell plans. We've got our phones and stuff on AT&T, and we've got a, a router up on top of the RV, which you can put in your vehicles and stuff that actually takes four different cell plan SIM cards inside of it, and then pumps that out as Wi-Fi throughout your, um, throughout your system. So like buses and stuff like that use it and trains and things, but you can easily input it, put that into like a field vehicle and then have, um, you know, have plans because we've got Verizon Sprint and Wi-Fi available to us at any one time yeah. um, as uh, so we can stay connected. Yeah, but I think I think the new gear I'm looking forward to is Starlink. Uh, that's a whole conversation on its own, but it's coming down the line for moving vehicles and for stationary for, you know, high speed Internet everywhere. Oh, wow. So until yeah. Starlink, give me a little more information about how you did this. So you because you said you could do this with like a field truck if you wanted to push out. Yeah. Uh, Wi-Fi. So how how'd that work? Uh, it works pretty great. It's basically a router. Uh, the router will look at again a four four sim up to four SIM cards at one time, and you can bring in existing Wi-Fi. So like in our particular case, we're in an RV park. We can pull in the camp Wi-Fi and 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 expand that a little bit, and then uh, pump it through the RV. So the router is just like your normal Wi-Fi router. And we have an antenna on the roof that actually um, amplifies yeah. those cell signals and brings them in. So oh, that is so cool. Um, yeah. Would you use that? Will you use something like that, Chris? I know that you've talked about connectivity in the field when you do your cultural work. Do you think you'll use something like that with your team on one of your next projects? You know, it's possible because uh, having the ability to connect and upload as many times as possible is is key. And the only downside to something like this is you can't take it that you can't take it away from the vehicle, right? It needs to be plugged in and hooked up to power. So, um, but if you're able to end your transects or something and get back to the field vehicle at certain key points of the day, you could have that upload connectivity. You know, because a lot of times we don't have any cell signals out in the field, but sometimes that's just like. Maybe you don't have AT and T, but you have Verizon, or maybe you don't have, you know, that, but you have Sprint or something like that. So um, that's why we have all the plans available, and this kind of system would allow you to do that. So that's yeah. pretty nerdy. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I do. I, I've been doing. You know, I work with a bunch of different companies, and I'm a consultant for different things. And I'm on Zoom calls probably five to eight hours a day, Monday through Friday. And I do podcast uploads and downloads, and and producing and recording. We have a YouTube channel that we're uploading videos to, and none of that's none of that's slowed down with the occasional internet hookup on Signal. None of that's really slowed down since June, and it's all because of the the tech we've got in the RV here and we got with us. So, all right. Yeah. So, uh, what's the one piece of technology gear you cannot live without for field work? For field work. I mean, I, I got to say it's the foundational key piece, right? It's a it's a really good high quality tablet um, or or phone, to be honest, that you can that you can really rely on. Um, you can't really cheap out on stuff like that. I mean, you kind of could, but you'd be buying one every few weeks. But like the iPhone 12 Pro Max now is my is my key piece of field gear. You know, I don't even need tablets anymore because this is a this is a really good device. Takes high quality photographs and um, is really easy to connect and and just do stuff with fits in my vest pocket. And it feels weird to say that my phone is like my one piece of field gear anymore, because if you were to ask me this 10 years ago, I would have said, Oh, a really great clipboard, you yeah. know, or, <laughs> or my, tr or my trowel or something like that. But to yeah. be honest, it's, it's this, because this is my maps. Um, I hook this to the EOS era 100 and I use an app called touch GIS on it to do all my GIS. And I flip over and I do all my recording with wild note, take all our pictures with it. Um, you know, and then on break, you're, you're screwing around on the internet. I mean, it's just, you know, it, it helps you focus and it helps you unfocus all yeah. at the same time. So, yeah, right. you know, huh. yeah. Um, and how about non-tech gear that you can't live without like boots or I don't know, like what's not. Yeah, no, that's, um, 
That's good. Uh, honestly, working in the high desert of, um, you know, Nevada and California a lot, I would say, you know, boots are, boots are almost a no brainer, but people almost, people think about boots a lot. Um, some people don't, but I would almost say backpack is something people think less about because you need a good quality backpack that has, uh, even though I'm carrying way less gear now that I'm fully digital, I still need a decent sized backpack that can hold a three liter bladder of water. And then usually an extra two liter um, refill bladder just because five liters in the in the heat of the summertime uh, is just crucial and the ability to carry that much water. And now I'm carrying around my drone with me too. I've got a little Mavic mini two that I can take out into the field. Um, and that fits back there and, you know, extra batteries and stuff like that. So a good, a good, nice, comfortable field bag with a waist strap and, and, and high water carrying capacity is, you know, essential. What's what, what one do you have? What's your bag of choice right now? Oh, I don't even know. It's uh, it's so old. I've had it for so long. I just love it. Um, I think it's a, I think it's an REI brand pack, honestly, that I bought like probably six, seven years ago, maybe eight years ago, and it's just been kicking. Uh, the other thing is, clean your zippers every field season, <laughs> if not every couple months. Yeah, you take them to the gas station and blow them out with the air, the free air, at the gas station, uh, and then rub some like silicone or chapstick on the zippers and run them through, and you'll keep them nice and fresh. <laughs> That's a nice one. extra little extra little tip there for the <laughs> listeners. Hey, Kristen, That's right. uh, can we uh, open that question up to the audience and have people put in chat what your favorite piece of tech and non-tech gear is? Yes. And we'll share that with everybody who's on the call okay. um, as well after this. So feel free to post links. Yes, please post links. And Nancy has... Um, promise that we will we will um, grab all the links and uh, send those out to everyone uh, for sharing the information. So mm -hmm. yeah, Rini, you wanna ask some questions? About the gear? Or, yeah. Um, well, I mean, a funny question would be, what's the one piece of gear that you bought that turned out to be a complete waste of money, a dud? I have a funny one, but I want to get yeah. answers. Yeah, um, uh, I would say uh, I would say batteries probably fall in that category uh, because there's so many different external batteries out there that kind of trying to find the right one that's going to be good and rugged and really fill up your fill up your devices quickly and but yet not die after a field season, right? They're not just like garbage and they die after a field season. I mean, those batteries might be heavy. Like I'm still a huge fan of the zero lemon rugged batteries. I've got two 30,000 milliamps that I've had for probably five or six years now. And they still, when, you know, until we get a full solar set up here in the RV, which we're doing in, uh, in June, when we're boondocking, which means we're overnight and we're not at a park, we're not plugged in, the outlets in our bedroom don't work. And my wife and I still use to charge up our phone and our, and our Apple watches, those two batteries on either side of our bed. Uh, and we just plug everything into it and they last us for, you know, four or five days of just charging our phones and stuff wow. and, uh, and keeping them going. So they're just a good battery. I, I can't overstate how much it is. And people, you can buy a cheap battery, a 10,000 one for 10 bucks at the gas station, but you're going to get $10 worth of life out of it. You know, it's, um, it's just, you got to spend good money, get a good rugged one lithium ion battery inside of it and uh and you'll have it forever i mean those batteries were 100 bucks a piece but like i said i've had them for five six years both of them so it's just been I totally just worth love it the, the image that you painted of like total <laughs> double wild nerds in the rv with your batteries charging your eye watch <laughs> oh my gosh right. i wonder if there's other folks in the universe that can parallel that so I do know of one um, mobile environmental consultant. She might have similar stories. I'll have to ask her. Yeah. Um, so yeah, bringing the battery out into the field with you, real good idea, right? Um, as you're mm -hmm. using more apps on the phone, the battery, and depending on how old your phone is, might not actually be able to last through the, the phone battery may not be able to last through the whole day, right? And so having that extra battery out there with you is key. Yeah, and it depends on what role you are in the field crew as well, because if you're uh, if you're a field technician and you are basically just doing field survey and you're pulling wild note out to record a site, 
your own phone battery may last for the entire day, depending on how much you're using it at break and at lunch and stuff like that. Are you listening to podcasts or something like that while you're walking? Um, there's certain theories around that. We won't get into that on this discussion, but uh, you know, how much are you using it? If you're just using it to record sites and maybe you're not finding a lot on this project, maybe you are, it's probably going to be mostly okay. Um, but if you're a field crew, like when I'm, when I'm out, mine's always on because I've got the maps up. I've got it hooked to the, to the submeter GPS. I, I'm running Bluetooth off of several different things. I've got the boot, the Bose Bluetooth, um, enabled, uh, headphone sunglasses. So those are connected and I'm using the podcast in my sunglasses. Well, I've got my external Bluetooth cooked to this and it's just tanking my battery down. And this is a brand new phone, you know, um, and it still is like by noon, my battery is just completely dead. So I've always got a battery with me and I actually wire, I actually keep the battery down in my vest and I wire an iPhone cable up around my neck. So it's not thing and I'm down into my pocket so I can just put my phone in there. I'm hoping to get one of those wireless chargers embedded in my chest so I can just put my phone in my pocket and it charges. But we don't have that tech yet. <laughs> have you tried any of the Have you tried any of the new clothing that supposedly charges your clothing, charges your stuff uh, while you're moving? No, not yet. I'm the kinetically charging clothing. I, I'm definitely <laughs> looking forward to that. It's not wireless charging yet, though. It still is like got a little battery. It's charging, but uh, I think that's uh, that's next level. It's coming down the line. So, so Chris, taking it to just preparing for. Um, your field season with act with your actual technology mm -hmm. with WildNote, like what are some best practices and best tips that you can give to the people on the call for how you get ready um, with yeah, your yeah. actual technology? Absolutely, and I'm doing that right now because we're not, I'm not doing um, you know a, a high frequency of projects anymore, but I'm doing some short some bigger less frequent projects. So I've got a, like a two month project coming up here in end of May. That's going to take a couple months and uh, and I'm teaming with two other companies on this. So we did this a similar fast to this project back in September. So this would hold for people that are working year round or maybe even have a little bit of a winter break. First thing I did was I, I go in and I did this at the end of the field season, but you always just want to make sure. But I go in and I clean up my users first. Right. I, I make sure I don't have any people in there that don't need to be in there, taking up a license, having access. Yep. Um, I clean up my users and then I clean up my projects. What did I finish over the over the winter? Because I had some reports that I was just waiting on the BLM to review and now I can archive those projects and get them off the system. Any projects that are still going, uh, I also clean up the users on those, right? Because even on archive projects, I'll still clean up the users. But um, on the on the existing projects, do I have people that aren't working on these anymore? So I'll clean those up as well. And then it's all about looking at the... Um, uh, looking at the new projects coming down the line. And then uh, I usually will download fresh copies of the survey forms from the WildNote survey form library, partly because WildNote's always coming out with new features and stuff. And sometimes I may not have that stuff turned on on the copies that I have, or I may not want to deal with it. Those copies are have default information in them and all kinds of stuff. So I'll just download a fresh set of forms for the projects that I need. Um, and then it's all about getting those projects ready, right? Making sure I have copies of the different set of field forms for different projects, and then having that uh, default information set in, which is crucial for saving tons of time in the field and in the, on the back end in the office. And it's setting the default information in can be, it, I mean, some people can see it as a little bit tedious, but I think it's totally worth it to just find out that info, you know, who's the landowner, where's, what's the map setting, you know, what all this different stuff that is not going to change for the project, get that put in. So when people start the, you know, start the season, that's already, that's already done. Um, and I think those are the big things, just clean up and prep, getting ready and uh, project documents, making sure you got all your project documents in there, your, your site numbers in there, your, um, uh, your isolate numbers, people always forget isolate numbers uh, if you're putting them in the same project. Um, I have all that stuff ready to go inside the project and and uh, and set up. So those are some of the big things from a wild note standpoint. What about, what about bringing on new users, Chris? How's that How's that look for you? What, what's your process there? Yeah, that's going to be a fun process this summer because we're partnering with the University of California at Berkeley to bring on interns, um, one a week actually. And uh, because we can't get them the mind safety and health training that, that they're not going to pay for that the $400 training to do it for, you know, longer, but so we're going to bring one new person out every week on that project. And, uh, and the onboarding for that is really great because we can just, we can just send them the link and then I can connect with them on the phone or on a zoom call 
and then give them a little bit of a tour, make sure they've got it set it up on their phone because that's where they're going to be using this mostly. And then uh, make sure that they're Audio, Chris, your audio, your audio went over. It's flipped over to one of your other fourteen possible channels <laughs> that communicating on. Maybe he's going well, through two at once. That's good timing, though, because we are going to end soon. So there we go. No, he's robot. So that's good timing, though, because it is eleven twenty-eight, and um. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Chris, our <laughs> one and only ultimate wild nerd. I'm so happy he was able to join us from some beautiful state park. Uh, and um, he here's his contact information um, and information for uh, his podcast network. And he's just a wonderful guy, just right on the cutting edge. Uh, really great guy to know. So please get a hold of him. Um, our next Lunch and Learn, we are so excited to have Lindsay Tunis of ICF. She's down in San Diego. Um, and she's the principal, she's a principal there, a restoration ecologist, mitigation program developer, and project manager with 15 years of professional experience in the design management and implementation of restoration projects. Now, she's also implementing with us at Wild Note Cram. So the California rapid assessment method, very, very cool uh, method going on there. And we are implementing both the form, the calculations and the final export in wild note. Um, so we're excited to have her come on and talk about restoration. We will have a wonderful, wonderful presentation about our amazing taxonomy framework that we built up here at wild note. And that is always the second Tuesday of the month. So. That will be in April on the second Tuesday. Were you raising your hand, Nancy? Was I? Yeah, I wanted to say um, in addition to that, well, it's April 13th, but we will also demo the um, success criteria export as well. So after that session, we'll go through if you're doing restoration work, if you know anyone who's doing restoration work, we have a great um, um, export tool that uh, can help you track your success criteria over time. So yeah, thanks for that. That is an amazing export we built and people are more and more companies are starting to um, want to utilize that. And I, I'm imagining we're the only one out there that's got something like that going on. <laughs> so in terms of apps. Uh, so yeah, thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you, Rini, Nancy, and thank you, Chris. It's really great to see you. And um, <laughs> Hope to see you on the interweb soon. <laughs>